Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We'll get started here in just a moment as people join the webinar. You're having a great day. Um, today we have Wiley Blevin speaking on phonics, so we're very grateful that uh, he's joining us, along with Lori Egan from Sadlier. So thank you both for taking the time to come on and share these resources with us. Feel free to let us know where you're uh, joining us from in the chat. Uh, if you have questions um, during the webinar, feel free to let us know in the Q&A box or comments in the chat. Got folks from Rochester, New York joining us. Welcome. In San Diego, okay, mm -hmm. other side. <laughs> And while more people join the webinar, I'll just go over a few housekeeping items um, real quick. Um, there will be a, um, a survey link that we'll share during the webinar. Um, and also um, once the webinar ends, and so feel free to, um, to give us your feedback, uh, especially if you're interested in a, in a certificate of attendance for the webinar. Like I mentioned earlier, feel free to submit questions in the Q&A. Uh, also invite you to join the conversation in the chat box but if there's specific questions you'd like to see addressed, we encourage you to use the Q&A rather than the chat. So we make sure um, that we see that. And CEA 2021 um, is coming up in early April real soon. So uh, please head to nca.org for more information if you'd like to register for that. And for other webinars, um, both on demand as well as upcoming, you could go to ncea.org slash webinars. And with that, before I pass it off to Laura, um, let's start with um, a short prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, thank you for this day, for this time we have together. We ask you to open our hearts and enlighten our minds to anything you have to tell us. We entrust our time together uh, to you as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So once again, thank you for joining us. And it's my pleasure to pass it off to Laura Egan from Sadlier. So thanks, Laura. Hi, Jonathan. Thank you so much um, for this opportunity to share with you and the members of NCEA a very important uh, webinar on a, an important topic. Um, before I want to get started, I'm Laura Egan. I want to introduce myself. I'm the Senior Director of Academic Marketing for William H. Sadlier. And many of you know about Sadlier. We've been around for almost 190 years, I think, now almost. Um, and we have been producing not only religion programs like We Believe and our new program, Christ in Us, but also math programs, core math programs, such as Sadlier Math and Progress in Mathematics. But we have a uh, very strong English language arts division and they're supplemental, all the programs there are supplemental and it ranges from vocabulary workshop to our new phonics program from phonics to reading by Wiley Blevins. So, um, I would just want to introduce you to Wiley. Um, he is an early literacy expert. And when I say expert, it, I don't use that word lightly. He truly is an expert in his field. And I learn every day when I talk with him for the past two years, I learn more and more. He's a teacher, an elementary school teacher, but he also graduated from the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Uh, he's an author of children's books, which you probably see if you're on Twitter or Facebook with following Wiley. He has lots of uh, children's books out, and he is the author of over 15 professional development books for teachers. He trains teachers around the world, Asia and um, throughout the United States, and he lives in New York City and loves to train teachers right in New York City. Uh, all the time. So Wiley, without further ado, I'd like to um, have you present to this wonderful group of educators. Great, thank you. 
Let me share my screen here. Can you see my screen? Excellent. Can you hear me okay? Excellent. So I'm going to uh, stop my video for just a second so you can focus on the screen. And I want to welcome everyone to our, our brief discussion today about phonics and the science of reading. This past year certainly has been one for the record books. It's been quite unique and quite challenging to say the least. I've been thinking a lot about the literacy journeys that our youngest readers and writers have been going on and comparing that to my literacy journey. When I talk to teachers, I often ask them if they remember how they learned to read. And a lot of teachers don't. They remember being read to, but the specifics about how they learn to read uh, might not they might not have as sharp of a memory about that, but I do remember how I learned to read because it was a big deal in my family. And I wanna share that with you because it's so tightly connected to some of the conversations we're having now about the science of reading, how we best teach young children to read. I'm originally from a very rural community in the mountains of West Virginia. I come from what I call legacy of illiteracy. My grandparents on my father's side never learned to read or write. So I saw the obstacles that were placed before them because they didn't have these basic skills. And on my mom's side, my grandmother only went to school to the fifth grade because after that you had to go into town and she didn't think she had fancy enough clothes. So I didn't grow up in a home with books and you might work with children who are in a similar situation, but we did have one book and you can guess from this picture what that book was. Ours was white, it had gold trim. It was the fanciest thing I had ever seen. It sat in our living room on our coffee table and when the sun would come in, it would, it would sparkle and shine. I was entranced by this huge thing called a book. And because I'm from the South, our, our Bibles have all of this information in the front, these pages that look like this, where my mom would write <clears throat> when someone was born, when someone got married, and also when someone would pass away. So it was sort of a family history that we would keep in our, in our, our Bible. But we also had a tradition where I'm from in West Virginia that when someone would pass away, we would actually take a picture of them in their casket and put it in our family Bible to remember them by. So as a very young child, I would walk over to this Bible, I would quickly open it and out would fly pictures of dead people. So I tell children, or I tell, I tell people that for the first four years of my life, I was terrified of books because books had dead people in them. It wasn't until I went to school that I learned that there were other kinds of books. We didn't learn how to read when I went to school until first grade. Kindergarten was more just sort of getting along and learning about how, uh, how, to, how school operates. So Mrs. Warshaw was my first grade teacher. And she handed me a copy of this book. And some of you might know this book, The New Fun with Dick and Jane. I was on the very tail end of the Dick and Jane era. And so Mrs. Warshaw would teach us a bunch of high frequency words. We'd learn them by sight. And then we'd read stories about Dick and Jane and their little sister, Sally. She'd teach us some more words and we'd read on and so on and so on. But Mrs. Warshaw knew that wasn't enough. She knew that didn't give us access to words, enough words quickly and quickly enough. So what she did is she also gave us something that looked a lot like this. It was a phonics workbook. And she taught us about our letters and sounds. She taught us that these strange squiggles stood for sounds and she taught it like a system. But for me, it felt like this amazing puzzle. All I had to figure out were the, the sounds that these symbols by themselves or in combination stood for, and then I would be able to read. And it was very exciting to me. And once I learned that it was the system, I began seeing words when I was at, uh, out at the store or at church, and I would try to figure out these sound spelling combinations. I remember very clearly figuring out that TH stood for the sound before Mrs. Warshaw taught it because there are lots of these and vowels and do it in, in, in the Bible and the things that, that we encountered at church. So I wanted to read everything I could get my hands on. But we were a very rural community. We didn't have a public library and we didn't have a school library. Really our only access to books were through these things called book clubs. I don't know if you, if you use those in your school, but every month we would get this, this flyer and it would have these descriptions of all these books and I would read every single entry. There's a book about volcanoes and a 
pop culture magazine, all these things were exciting to me. I'd go over here and check, 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 check all the books I wanted, hand it to my mom, and she would <laughs> erase, erase, erase all but a, a few that we could afford. But that was my access to books, and it was super exciting. And I share with you these two book covers because these were two books that I bought very early on. And I share with you, them with you because they represent the kind of reader I was, what turned me on to reading. You'll notice that both books, Runaway Slaves, The Story of Harriet Tubman and Sharks are both nonfiction. I was what you call an info kid. I was really intrigued by people's lives and the world outside my community. I mean, we didn't have sharks in our creek, so I wanted to grow up someday and see a shark and pet a shark and, and all of that. But this really served me well because I was reading so much informational text, my vocabulary and my background knowledge was building very, very quickly. And that served me well as I went through the grades because I had all of the store of information and this wide vocabulary to tackle increasingly more complex text. So when I think about what Mrs. Warshaw did, she taught me phonics. We know that the basic phonics skills we typically teach now in kindergarten, first and second grade, if we teach those really well, it gives students access to sounding out about 84% of the words that they will encounter in the books that we give them to read. Also through those Dick and Jane books, I learned my high frequency words, the most common words in English. We know that the top 100 high frequency words account for about half of the words children will encounter. So these are really important words. And because I read so much informational text, my wide reading really helped to build my vocabulary and my background knowledge. So I think Mrs. Warshaw did a, a really terrific job. Obviously, I learned how to read, but I've been thinking a lot about her because of this conversation we're having about the science of reading. I know you've all heard about this, this national conversation. If there's anyone who, who hasn't, just to sort of summarize it briefly, there's this large body of knowledge that we have about how children learn to read. A lot of it has come from us, uh, teachers, educational researchers, but there are other sciences that have been looking at how children learn to read, like cognitive psychologists, people who do brain research. And recent surveys in the United States, the UK, Australia, have shown that this knowledge is largely unknown by classroom teachers because it's largely untaught in our teacher prep courses at our universities. And unfortunately, when you look at this body of knowledge from these other sciences and compare it to some of the reading programs that are most commonly used, that information either isn't evident or it's ignored. And that is why we're having this conversation because we aren't taking advantage of a, a big body of information that can really accelerate our students' learning, uh, fine-tune our teaching. So in this conversation around the, the science of reading, there are these two old models of reading that have re-emerged and that people are talking about. I want to share both of them with you because they, they really help couch uh, the proper place uh, for phonics instruction. So the first is what's called the simple view of reading, came out in the mid 1980s by Guff and Tunmer. And it says that in order for us to comprehend what we read, it is a product of our decoding abilities. So all the things we do with phonics and learning our high frequency words and so on, and our language comprehension skills. So our vocabulary, our background knowledge, and so on. One without the other does not lead to skilled, competent reading. So if we just focus on decoding and we aren't building language and background knowledge, it will make reading more difficult and vice versa. Now, this simple view of reading was fine tuned in 2001 by a researcher named Scarborough. And you may have heard of her reading rope, Scarborough's reading rope. And what she did is she took the simple view of reading which you see here, and she just fine tuned it to really focus in on all the aspects we can deal with in our instruction. So in that decoding piece, we are talking about decoding the phonics instruction. We are talking about phonological awareness and the important role that plays in terms of reading and writing development and sight word recognition. How do we orthographically map those words so that to memory so that we can quickly access them? How do we get lots and lots of words to be recognized by sight? And in that language comprehension piece, she's talking about, yes, vocabulary and background knowledge, but also knowledge of language structures and so on. And her concept is, is that as we become more proficient in word recognition, as we can recognize more and more words automatically, we also become more strategic 
and our, the use of our language comprehension skills because we know more words, we have wider vocabularies, we know more background knowledge, and we're bringing all of these resources to bear as we attack increasingly more complex text. So they begin to intertwine and that helps us develop into skilled fluent readers who can, who can process the information in increasingly more complex texts. So those are the two basic models. There are other researchers who have gone further and fine to them, but these are the two that you hear about the most. So back to phonics. And I like this because it puts phonics in its place. It is one key aspect of our early reading instruction. So when I first started uh, working with teachers to fine tune what they were doing with phonics and working with publishers, I really focused on the seven characteristics of strong phonics instruction. And you see them listed here and many of the, these or all of these you're probably very familiar with like blending the primary strategy we teach children to sound out words, dictation, how do we help children transfer their phonics to writing by thinking aloud about that process. So that's the value of those dictation exercises. Word awareness activities like word building and word sorts where we make our instruction really active, engaging and thought provoking. Students are making public what they know about how English words work, making observations about words that really help fine tune and solidify their understandings. And also what's the role of the types of books that we use in our reading instruction. So these were things I focused on for a, a very long period of time. And then something interesting happened when the Common Core Standards came out, which feels like a lifetime ago now, a lot of districts were looking at how they transform their instruction, like how do we do close reading, how do we include more informational text, some of the things that were being focused on. But most of the districts I visited were also evaluating areas of their reading instruction that weren't working as well as they could. And across the board, foundational skills which includes phonics were, were an issue. And it didn't make sense on paper because all these districts had phonics instructional materials and they had assessments and they had trained their teachers to use these materials and assessments, but they weren't getting the kinds of results they expected it. And on paper, it, it didn't, it really didn't make sense. So my area of study really switched to what happens if we have everything in place we think we should and we're not getting the results that we expect. What could be standing in the way? And so what I found is that there are 10 big reasons why phonics instruction can fail. And some of these are issues with the curriculum materials we're using, where there are these obstacles that uh, don't get students to master the skills as quickly and as efficiently as they should. And some are related to the delivery of the instruction. Now. I'm gonna focus in on a few of these throughout our conversation today because they do relate to the science of reading like an inadequate or non-existent review and repetition cycle. I'll talk a lot about that. A lack of application to real reading and writing. We know that it's in the application where the learning sticks. So how much application are we really doing in our phonics lessons? Inappropriate reading materials to practice skills and the types of assessments and how that can really inform us to fine tune our instruction to help our students get to mastery faster. So we will address all of these, all of these things. There are a couple articles that uh, you might be able to have uh, quick access to that summarize this. This is the paper I wrote for the International Literacy Association called Meeting the Challenges of Early Literacy Phonics Instruction. It's on their website, it's free and downloadable. And I review the seven characteristics of strong phonics instruction and talk about the 10 reasons why phonics instruction can sometimes fail. In Principal Magazine, I also wrote an article called A Fresh Look at Phonics that takes those ideas and then provides for administrators some look fors when they're evaluating their curriculum and watching teachers teach, some things that can help take that instruction to the next level. Okay, so let's focus today on those four guideposts of early phonics instruction and the science of reading. And you see those listed here. And these are the kinds of things you want to consider to determine whether or not the instruction you're using is aligned, closely aligned to this big body of knowledge that we call the science of reading. And the first guidepost is scope and sequence. 
we certainly need a clearly defined scope and sequence that serves as the spine of all instruction. We don't want book-based or random scope and sequence. We want something that's clearly defined. It progresses from easier to more complex, and it's built for efficient mastery so that students can then transfer those skills. So a scope and sequence is much more than just a list of skills. A scope and sequence is what you do with those skills. So if you just march through a scope and sequence, you know, each week you're introducing a new skill, that is what I call exposure focused instruction. For students to really master the skills, we need to, after we introduce it, hold on to it for a much longer time than what's embedded in most curriculum. So for most skills that I teach, after I introduce it, I need to provide my students with consistent review, repetition, application for about the next four to six weeks for them to get to mastery. And what I'm talking about is for them to be able to readily use that skill when reading and spelling those words. We know that writing lags behind reading, so we need even more focus in that area to get students to mastery. If we just march through the skills, what can happen is what I refer to as decayed learning. We introduce a skill, we do it really well, we move on to the next skill. There isn't that carry through and that extended application. And so some of that learning begins to slip away. And that can be an enormous issue in terms of phonics instruction, the issue of decayed learning. So we wanna to get to mastery quickly and efficiently because mastery isn't our goal. Our goal is transfer. Students master it, they know the skill well, so then they can transfer it to all reading and writing situations. It takes time. It takes more time than what is embedded in most curriculum, which is why when I talk about the 10 reasons why phonics instruction sometimes fails, the very first thing I address is an inadequate or non-existent review and repetition cycle. I have teachers look at the skill they're teaching that week, flip through their curriculum and mark all the places in the upcoming four to six weeks where that skill is reinforced, retaught, applied, and so on. And often we find far too little. So I have this mantra with the reading coaches I work with here in New York City, no more one and done, now one and just begun. And I think it applies to all learning, but it's specifically with phonics, once we introduce a new skill, we really need to think about all the ways we can hold on to that skill for as long as possible. So there are different aspects of the lesson where you can do that quite, quite easily. So when you introduce a new skill, you're gonna write some words on the board to model for students how to blend or sound out those words and give them some practice doing that in isolation before they read a, a text. So here you see that the students are practicing or they're learning short O, so you see a bunch of short O words. But these words in red are words from the previous four to six weeks. Adding in those words, holding on to that instruction checking to make sure students still have access to that skill. And what I do is I always include a couple words that the students have seen in the previous lessons like cat and red and a couple words they haven't like rip and map to see how readily they can transfer those skills. The other thing that I would point out about this particular activity is that you'll notice that these lines go from easier to more complex. This first line, not hot, lot, dot, the words only vary by beginning sound. Lot, log, dot, dog, they vary by final. Hot, hat, hit, hut, they vary by medial. I think it's really important in any instruction, but specifically phonics instruction, that we organize the activities from easier to more complex so that you can more readily determine where children have difficulties and which children have difficulties. Great teaching, as you know, is teaching and assessing simultaneously. So if you organize, items within any exercise in that way, you can more readily find out who needs what support. Also, if you're doing any kind of activity whole group, you need some level of differentiation. So you notice those words in blue, jog to jogging, hop to hopping. I know that I have students in this whole group lesson who can already sound out CVC words with short O. So I'm picking a skill from further in the scope and sequence that's related. So here we're adding a uh, ing, but doubling that consonant. So that's something I can introduce and also reinforce during small group time with those students who are ready for that level of challenge or enrichment. Another area where you can add in more review and repetition is during dictation or what's called guided spelling. So this begins in our phonemic awareness work where we teach children how to segment, orally segment the sounds and words. And a popular tool to do that are these uh, sound boxes or Elkonen boxes where we give students a bunch of counters 
and we have them drag one counter onto each box as they segment the sound. So it would look something like this. Sat. For the word sat, we would drag one counter for each of those three sounds. So this is where most of the instruction stops. What we really need to do is then, after we've segmented, rebuild it with those letters to make that reading writing connection. So I ask children, what's the first sound in sat? S what letter do we write for that sound? The letter S. And we slowly rebuild that word. So this is what's getting students ready for spelling. Because when students first spell words, what are they doing? They haven't memorized how to spell the words. They have to think about each individual sound and they're attaching a letter or a spelling to that sound. So a couple times a week for the students I work with, I do dictation or guided spelling where I will have them spell a couple words with the target skill and a simple sentence. And we have a conversation, it's not a test. They have supports if they need to tap the sounds or they need their sound boxes or they need to look at the alphabet cards for, for clues, what have you, that's what they do. But I also, include a couple words from the previous four to six weeks. And the way I choose these words is I, I look at students writing to see what skills I've previously taught that they aren't consistently and accurately applying in their writing. So I'm gonna do more dictation work with those because I will be able to have those conversations. What's that sound you hear? What letter have we learned? And so on. I believe that we need to start dictation far earlier than I, I see it in a lot of curriculum. So early, early kindergarten, after I've taught some letters, I will say some sounds and have children write the letters and we'll build to a couple simple words and then a very simple sentence. <clears throat> there are lots of ways in which we can accelerate learning in our basic phonics instruction and fold in that, that review and repetition. And one is handwriting. I often see children practicing writing the letters over and over and over. And I think, well, what is our instructional goal? Is it just that they write pretty letters? No, it's that they connect that letter to a sound. So if I had students practicing writing the letter S, I would have them say the sound as they write each letter. So it'd be S, S, S. I'm connecting the letter to the sound as many times as they are writing that letter, which could be a half a dozen or more. And I'm connecting the physical motion of making that letter to the sound. Here again, accelerating that learning, connecting it across different, different areas of my phonics instruction. The other way to build it in review and repetition cycle, which is something a lot of teachers do, is just that 30 second daily warm up with those, those spelling cards. So you have a set of cards with all the, the letters and spellings you've taught up to that point. You show the cards, students correlate, say the sounds, and that gives you a clear sense what they know and what they don't know. Because if all of a sudden they get softer or they're, they're more quiet, then they haven't all mastered that. But it keeps those sound spellings fresh in their memory. It's a great activity to do as a 30 second warm up for kindergarten and first grade. For older students, grades two and beyond, I would do the same thing with syllables. There are 322 syllables that make up 5,000 very common words. And so after we've taught those basic sound spellings in K1 and a little bit into two, we can transition to then working on those most common syllables, word parts that we want to really jump out at students when they're tackling those longer multisyllabic words like T-I-O-N, S-U-R-E, V-E-N, U-N, and so on. And so that can also be a really effective warm up. And the last thing is the rereading of previously read stories. So if you have, if you're reading a new decodable story this week during independent work time, students can find a partner and read the, the book from the previous week on Monday. And then on Tuesday, they can read the book from two weeks ago and on Wednesday from three weeks ago. Having that cycle built in so that students are rereading. A lot of teachers I work with don't like to manage lots of little books. So what they will do after a student reads uh, a decodable book, they will just type up the story on one sheet of paper, number that paper. Students have a folder with all their decodable stories. And the teacher will say, during independent work time today, I want you to find a partner and I want you to read to each other stories nine and 10. Those are the stories from last week. And then on Tuesday, read stories seven and eight and make sure you sign the back so that I know that you had a chance to read those stories and so on. Just building in that rereading, that fluency cycle can be really beneficial. 
Yeah, second guidepost is that the instruction is systematic and explicit. These are two terms you hear all the time with phonics instruction. Explicit just means that in the initial introduction, we explicitly state that sound spelling connection. So we let children know that the s sound is represented by the letter S. Instead of using a discovery method, because a discovery method, like where a teacher might write a bunch of words on the board, have students figure out what do they all have in common, which would require them to be able to orally segment off that first sound and know the name of the letter and so on. It might require students to have some prerequisite skills that all not all students would have. So we want the instruction to be explicit so that all students get that learning right away. It doesn't mean that during the phonics instructional cycle, everything has to be that way. I like to do activities like word building and word sorts where students are talking about words and they're, they're playing with letters and sounds and really solidifying their understanding of how to use those letters and sounds. So I like instruction that involves conversation and observation um, and exploration where we are making public our thinking about how English words work because it gives me insights into what my students do and do not know. So word building activities, word sorts and so on are really great for that. Systematic instruction is not just teaching phonics as a system, which is absolutely critical, but it's building in that review and repetition cycle, which we already talked about. So here's a clear example of what that would look like in a program. So let's say this is grade one and lesson one, we are working with short A, which would be a review from kindergarten. Lessons two through five, we would be working with the other short vowels, but my students would still see short A words during blending exercises, because I'd fold in some of those. During dictation, the reading of the decodable text would have some short A words and word building and so on. And I would be assessing this skill, not only that week I introduced it, because very few kids get to mastery in reading and writing those words in just one week, I would be assessing it over an extended period of time. And I'll show you some assessments that do that in, in just a few minutes. And then after we've learned the skill, we're going to keep developing it as we start learning more complex skills like consonant blends and digraphs in these later lessons. I'm going to start with a word students know like hat, which they learned in lesson one, and compare it to a word with a new skill like chat. So I'm reviewing what they know, going to the new. These are related. So then we can have this really rich conversation. What changed between hat and chat? What sounds different? What looks different? How do the letters CH work together? Remember what, what I just taught you, that these, these work as a team and they make a new sound and so on. Same thing when you're going to long vowels, going from a word they know like ran to a new word like rain can reinforce that concept of those vowel teams. And then of course we need to assess these students, not only in terms of the, the types of assessments that are embedded in your program. And I'll talk about cumulative and comprehensive assessments in a bit, but also evaluating student writing gives us a tremendous amount of information about what students know, because if they are applying consistently skills in writing, I know they can read words with those skills. Same thing with listening to students read and collecting information about which words they struggle with and why. So sometimes when I'm talking to teachers, they get a little nervous when I say systematic because they associate systematic just with having a scope and sequence. The one thing I wanna make very clear is systematic does not mean that all children receive the same phonics instruction on the same day at the same time and only that instruction. This is where phonics instruction becomes really, really complicated. All students need to be exposed to grade level instruction during our whole group lessons. But that means that that instruction needs some differentiation because there will be students who are still working with previously taught skills. So they're below level in terms of grade level expectations on phonics. And then there are some students who have already mastered those skills. So we need some challenge enrichment in that whole group instruction. And it, will help us modify our expectations. So if I'm doing a word sort and there are 10 words with long A and I still have students who are working on short vowels, I'm not going to make them sort all 10 words. I will give them a subset, maybe three or four words like play, say, day, words that I know are very, very useful for them to know. So I will modify my expectations at that point for them. And then it's during small group where we differentiate that instruction, where we target their specific needs. So I might have some on-level students who need more guided practice and application to keep up with the pace of the instruction. 
I might have students who are still working with previously taught skills. So this is my time to find out what skills they haven't mastered and really plug in those foundational skill holes. And it's a great opportunity for those students who have already mastered the skills at that point in the school year to accelerate by placing them further in that scope and sequence and moving them as far as they possibly can go to get the most out of the instruction I'm delivering. Okay, the third guidepost is daily application to reading and writing. As I said earlier, it's in the application where the learning sticks. And too often, this is where phonics instruction falls short. Too often, I see a lot of isolated skill work. And if we don't increase the amount of application to reading and writing, many of our students don't get to mastery as quickly and as efficiently as we need them to be. So when I started looking at some of the issues in phonics instruction, this really emerged as a big issue because I was looking at what teachers were doing during their, their phonics time. And these were two teachers in the same school, um, same hallway. And I just wrote down what was happening during their phonics lessons. And so teacher A, in 30 minutes, she did an action rhyme review. She did some phonemic awareness. She introduced the phonics skill model to sound out words. And then she spent five minutes reading a story, a decodable story of the student. So there was five minutes of application. Whoops. Sorry, teacher B did five minutes of a warm up, five minutes of phonemic awareness, five minutes of introducing the new skill and modeling blending, but she spent 10 minutes working on that story and really digging in. And five minutes, she gave the students some writing follow up that they couldn't finish in the phonics lesson, but they finished during independent work time. So she had 15 minutes of application. So I, I wondered, if this is typical of what's happening in these classrooms day after day, week after week, what would that mean in terms of opportunities to apply the skill in reading and writing if it's in the application where that learning really sticks? So teacher A, five minutes a day would give those students about 25 minutes a week of application, which would be 15 hours in the school year. Whereas teacher B, 15 minutes a day would be 75 minutes a week, which would be 45 hours in the school year. These students have a 30 hour advantage applying those skills, getting to mastery faster so that they can then transfer, making sure that we include more application time during our phonics lessons. Yeah, they might be doing reading and writing elsewhere as well, but during the phonics lessons really has a significant impact. So the main application tool are these decodable or phonics readers. I call them accountable texts because they're texts that I can hold students accountable for because there's a close match between what I've taught and what I'm having them read. And also holds me accountable as a teacher. If I'm doing what I need to do for my students, they should be able to read these stories with relative ease. So I just wanna show you a little bit about the, the power of these early texts. So imagine for a minute that you're in my kindergarten classroom. I've taught you these two words, I, C. This symbol stands for the A ah sound and the word A. This symbol stands for the t sound, spelled T, and this symbol stands for the k sound, spelled C. This is the photograph on the page you're going to read. I'm gonna show you a sentence and I want you all to read it. I'll pretend like I can hear you, but you'll have no problems reading it. One, two, three, read. I'm sure all of you would, were very uh, successful at reading I See a Cat. And the reason it was so easy for you, and, and a lot of you are thinking, well, there was a close connection between what I had you read and that photograph. Absolutely, that was supportive. But there was also this really close connection between what I had you read and what I taught. For me, these early texts serve two functions. They give our students a lot of practice reading words with the phonic skills and those high frequency words that we're teaching, but they also help develop this I can do it attitude in our early readers and writers. Reading can be quite challenging for students and we want them to believe in their ability to tackle this thing called reading. And as we go through the phonics scope and sequence, it gets increasingly more complex, multiple spellings for a sound and so on. We want them to know that they can do it. And so I think these texts have these, these dual uh, functions and benefits. So I'm going to take away the picture and just add a word to give you a little bit of a challenge to see how you do without that support. So on the count of three, I want you all to read. One, two, three, read. So 
So if we were all together in a room in person and I told you I was going to go around the room and have you all read aloud, how would you feel right now? <laughs> I think a lot of you would probably do what a lot of teachers do when I do this exercise. Look down, this is a great time to go to the restroom, check your phone. Uh, why was this so difficult? It was so difficult because there was such a disconnect between what I asked you to read and what I taught you. Unfortunately, too many children experience this in our classrooms. We teach them this during phonics and we have them read this. And so they have to rely on other ways to tackle this text or develops a, a deep sense of frustration in their ability to read. That's why this close connection is so critical for our beginning readers. It's really interesting. Beginning texts have become the new battleground in this national debate around the science of reading. I said that it's called the science of reading because there are these other sci sciences who are informing us, giving us information about how children learn to read. And one of those sciences are, are those brain researchers. And this is a study out of Stanford that got a lot of attention several years ago, and people are still talking about it because it does affect how we approach these beginning texts. So in this particular study, they had two groups of participants where they taught them how to read this, this new sound symbol uh, language. They had one group that were learning by what we would call phonics. They learned the sounds for the individual symbols, and they had another group who learned the words as whole units. So if you look at the first bullet, what they found, and then they, they took brain scans, these functional MRIs where they looked at what parts of the brain were activated, what parts lit up to see how that corresponded to what parts of the brain light up when we as skilled readers read. So what they found in bullet one is that beginning readers who focus on letter sound relationships or phonics, instead of trying to learn whole words, increase activity in the area of their brains best wired for reading. So those brain pictures, those functional MRIs, the parts that lit up were very similar to the parts that light up when we as skilled readers read. Very, very interesting. Words learned using a whole word method, so that group, activated the right side of the brain, which is characteristic of children and adults who struggle with reading. So when they compared those brain pictures of the children reading using the sight word, the whole word method, it mirrored the same kinds of, of brain scans that they would take for, for children and adults who have difficulties with reading. The other thing that I think is really fascinating about this study that applies, especially to the kindergarten teachers that I work with, the participants who learned with the whole word method took off really fast. It, it reminds me of when I learned Dick and Jane. I learned a few words, applied it, learned some more words and applied it and so on. They took off really fast, were doing really well, but as soon as words were introduced that they hadn't learned as whole units, they really struggled and they hit a wall because they hadn't spent time really analyzing the individual pieces of those words. So they couldn't take those pieces and transfer it to new words. Whereas the students learning the phonics way started out slowly. It was work. It was a lot of work. They had to look at every symbol and attach it to a sound. And until they could get those sounds, sound symbol relationships known fast, it took some time. So they started out more slowly, but as soon as new words were introduced, words they, you know, they had all these different spellings that they had learned, they were able to transfer much more readily and far surpass the whole word method. So think about kindergarten teachers who are starting with like the pattern books and there's a close connection to these simple patterns in the pictures and students take off really well. When will they hit a wall if we don't spend the time focusing on those individual pieces? And that's what this study really asks us to question. So an exercise I do with kindergarten teachers is I take two texts from the same point of the year and I ask that same question. So here's a pattern text, it's level C. So it's the second half of kindergarten. The book is called Puppies Get Into Lots of Silly Spots. Puppies get into lots of silly spots. Two puppies are in the boots. Absolutely adorable. Puppies get into lots of silly spots. Three puppies are in the flowers. What, what does the next page say? You all know. Puppies get into lots of silly spots. Four puppies are in something adorable. We read two pages. You already know the pattern. You already know that you're gonna have to, what is changing is that number and what the puppies are in. That's so I asked teachers to code this story based on what they had taught their students. So all the words in red were the words that were fully decodable. They could sound out 
these words. And there was only one word on each, on each page. The words in blue were those high frequency words that had been taught. So the students knew them as sight words. And there were a couple words on each page that fit into that category. The green words were all the other words. So we went through and we looked at how are students actually accessing these words? How are they getting puppies? Maybe initial sound, picture clue. What about get? They don't know shorty yet. So how are they gonna figure that out? Teacher would say, well, I'm giving them that word and so on and so on. It was a very painful exercise to go through to see how children were really having to access these words. And what the teachers realized is that after a couple of pages, they memorized the pattern and that's how they were access accessing. So that was really a whole word approach to the beginning reading. Then we took a decodable text. This was the text at that same point in the, in the year. Can Sam sit? Sam can sit in the chair. Can the cat sit? The cat can sit. It sits on the mat. Certainly not as exciting as cute puppies and boots, but when we coded these words, you'll see that almost all the words students could sound out. So I know as a teacher what I can reinforce and how I'm getting students to master those phonics skills. Then there were some words that were high frequency words that the students had learned by sight. And then there was a story word that they had to access in a different way. So it's interesting. Sometimes when I'm working with a child I haven't worked with before, I will hand them a book and have them turn to that first page in the story and see what they do. Some children will put their finger on that first word and just begin sounding out those words or working through those words. Other children will open the book and just scan the page, look at the illustrations. That tells me what they think reading is and how they, what habits they have developed to attack text. And that can be, that can be a problem. So there's a lot of conversation about the three queuing systems in the science of reading. Certainly as adults, we access all these different queuing systems as need be. But the question is, what is, it, what is best to focus in on with our beginning readers? I don't even think that's the, the right question because I believe that the text determines the cues that the children have to use. So if you look at this text, because children can sound out most of those words, that's what they're going to use to attack this text. We, we're human beings. We like the path of least resistance. So we are going to do what is, what is uh, most reliable for us. Whereas the pattern text, we're going we're gonna to memorize the pattern. So we're developing the text is really affecting the behaviors that students are developing. So this has been known for a very long time. Back in the mid eighties, when I first started teaching, there was a study by Jewel and Roper Schneider that talked about this and it really influenced my thinking. But for some reason over the years, the, we've sort of forgotten about this. And in this study, the children were learning to read in first grade, not kindergarten like they are now. So when you see first grade in this, this quote, which I think is a really important quote to look at, uh, you can replace it with kindergarten and it would apply to today. But what they said is the selection of text used very early in first grade may at least in part determine the strategies and cues children learn to use and persist in using in subsequent word identification. In particular, emphasis on a phonics method seems to make little sense if children are given initial text to read where the words do not follow those regular phonics uh, generalizations. The types of words which appear in beginning reading text may well exert a more powerful influence in shaping children's word identification strategies than the method of reading instruction. And that's what really threw me for a loop as a beginning teacher, because what that means is I can teach great phonics lessons, but if I'm giving them text where they can't readily apply it and they have to use other ways of accessing the words, that phonics instruction isn't gonna have the impact I need it to have. So the text really has an enormous influence on how children attack this thing we call reading. So there's this current conversation about decodable text. Some teachers love it, some teachers hate it. There's a conversation about do this, don't do that, black and white and so on. I think we need a more nuanced conversation, especially when it comes to this whole notion of cues. Um, and so, I want to just share with you a little bit about what decodable texts are and how we can make them more impactful resources. So <clears throat> the, the way decodable texts are constructed are really uh, determined by some states' uh, reading criteria. There are a couple states like California and Texas who have required decodable texts as part of their reading curriculum. So the publishers have to design these texts based on what those states say, and that impacts the text that all the other states get because publishers make one set of decodable books. 
And it's interesting, the definitions are very similar. So in California, the decodable text need to be 75 to 80% of the words uh, must be words that can be sounded out based on the previously taught phonics skills. So about three out of every four words children should be able to sound out. The remaining 20 to 25% of the words, so about one out of every four, can be previously taught high frequency words that are regular that you can't sound out, or some story content words to make really interesting, great stories. So what does that mean if we're working with a child and we're reading through a story? So this is one of the books from, from Phonics to Reading. The students have learned all their consonants. They've learned short A and short I. So you see on this first page, what is it? It is a man. Students can sound out all the words except the word what, which is a high frequency word that they will, that they will learn in a different way, which I'll show you in a second. So we know that we can reinforce blending or sounding out words, reinforce those phonics skills. What is it? It is a pan, same thing. All the words they can access very easily using their phonics skills except the word what. Then we get to this third page. What is it? It is an, and we have our first story word. How would we attack that? If we wanna reinforce the best ways to teach children to read. Well, I know that students know short A and short I. I know they know their consonants. So I would direct students to the letters in the word and we would sound out this first chunk of this word, app, because we know that part. We don't know the PLE yet, but we know app. And then I would take children to the, the picture. Do you see anything in this picture that begins with the app sounds? So we looked at letters, now we're thinking about sounds and we're using the supports. And in this particular book, they're looking at the shadows. So we would be able to figure out it's the word apple and we would keep reading. So it's not that we don't use other cues, it's just that our main focus would be on using our graphophonics cues, our, our, our phonics ability. I think that classrooms need a wide range of texts for different instructional purposes. Decodable texts play a really important role in kindergarten or first grade. Lesser role as you go up the grades. You might have some students who are a bit older and you want some decodable text to focus in on, give them more practice with skills that they're still working on. Uh, and then our level books and trade books. As students learn more and more skills, you can start folding in more and more of those books. Uh, so that's your decoding piece. And then of course we need those trade book read alouds to build students vocabulary and background knowledge. And we need to be reading to them every day and having those rich conversations. So that's your language comprehension piece. So when you think about the simple view of reading, these books really fill in both of those important parts. There are some teachers I work with who currently have just guided reading books, level books. And so what we do is we take the levels and I fold in a phonics scope and sequence that we're going to focus in on each level. And as we find or create decodable books, we list those for that particular level. And that's what we start with. And then we reevaluate all of our other books at this particular level. So if this is level F, we're working on final E, we look at all the books that have the most reinforcement of final E words, along with previously taught skills, and we will include those in that particular level. If there are books that don't, like we might find books that have predominantly long vowel spellings, we will move those to later levels and those will become independent reads. So, so there are ways of adjusting the resources you have in your classroom to, to better match the decoding needs of your students. Okay, I'm gonna go a little bit faster because we're a little bit short on time. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit uh, how we turn these decodable texts into more impactful learning tools. We know from, from research, becoming a nation of readers back in 1985 said that decodable texts need to be instructive. They need to be a lot of words with the phonics skills to get to mastery, that makes sense. They need to be comprehensible. They need to be, make sense, follow natural sounding English sense patterns. We've all seen some decodable texts that don't make sense and that is a problem. We need to have a higher bar for the text we use with our students. And they need to be engaging. They need to be texts that are worth reading, rereading to develop fluency, worth writing about, talking about, and so on. So we need to choose those texts that are really worth reading. Lots of fiction and informational texts. And you'll see some great examples here, like some of those from, from phonics to reading. But I want you to think about how you can take these texts and be more impactful in terms of the instruction. So we know we're gonna read them to develop our, our decoding abilities, but what about vocabulary? It's such an issue with students. How can we take a little decodable, like lots of frogs where the text is, I see a frog, the frog can hop, hop, frog, hop, and build vocabulary. It's not a natural thing that you would think of building vocabulary, but imagine during your read aloud time, you read a really great trade book, like Red-Eyed Tree Frog about frogs. And you talked about frog habitats. 
Then when you read your decodable, and as you were going through, you saw these great photographs of frogs in different habitats. You could reinforce the word habitat and the learning that children had in this, this particular trade book. So that's one great connection you can make, but it's not a connection you can make with every single book. But one thing you can do is to pre-teach an academic tier two word that you can use to talk about the book, but isn't in the book. So here's an example of a decodable book. When you introduce a book, you always uh, sound out the title and talk about the cover illustration. In this particular conversation with students, I would talk about how the frogs live in a pond. If they didn't know the word pond. And that a pond is the frog's habitat. A habitat is a, the place where animals live. And so I would have the students repeat the word habitat and I would tell them as we read, we're going to look for clues in the words and pictures that tells more about a frog's habitat. So as we're reading, I would stop and ask questions. What did we learn about a frog's habitat here? Turn to your partner and use the word habitat. If there's any writing we do after, try to use the word habitat in your writing. So just choosing one academic word that I can use to talk about the, the book and introduce with the book is just a very simple way to every single day up the vocabulary learning of our students. You also wanna focus in on both decoding and comprehension. So I ask a series of questions that get progressively more complex and develop deeper understanding of what we are, what we are talking about and develop basic uh, reading behaviors. So this is a story called My Big Trip. Mid first grade, students are learning long A spelled A-I and A-Y. So I ask uh, a bunch of questions. I have students turn to a partner first to answer the question before I call a volunteer. So they're all processing language. They're all having opportunities to use that language. The first question I focus on a word with a new phonics skill. So where did the girl go on a trip? Point to the country's name in the story. So I'm asking them to find a word with a new skill, which is Spain, but I'm also forcing them to reread, which is really great. Getting more reading practice in that reading lesson. The second question, I'm prompting students to find a detail and support it with text evidence. So what did the girl do in Spain? find the sentences that tell, that tell you this. Supporting your answers with evidence is a really great behavior that we want to instill in our early readers that we can start with even these most basic, these, these most basic books. Then I ask some higher level questions and also a question that connects the book to students' lives. So I use this pattern over and over. The other thing is that I always connect this work to writing. So, I don't see enough writing happening in phonics instruction. And the great thing about writing about a decodable text is that it forces the child to use words with a new target skill in that writing. So if there are lots of long A words that they read and I have them write a retelling, they're gonna to have to use lots of long A words and so on. So if it's fiction, maybe they do a retelling or put the characters in a new setting. If it's informational, they can write a list of facts they learned or draw a picture and write the most interesting information they learned something like that. If students need more support, I can give sentence frames and sentence starters and so on. It is really important that we include some talk before students write. This is my favorite quote about writing from James Britton, reading and writing float on a sea of talk. If we wanna get great writing from students, we need to start with some talk. And so there are lots of fun ways we can do that. Certainly just turning to a partner and sharing your ideas. But for example, if we want students to write a retelling, some teachers I work with draw a story path on the floor. Some will label beginning, middle, and end. Some will have students draw pictures or write notes on note cards. And a couple of students will practice their retelling as the other students are sitting here in judgment. Now they're sitting here providing feedback on things that student might have left out. And they're also thinking about their retelling. So they processed all that information before they pick up the pencil and they're ready to write some really great retellings. So there are lots of ways in which we can make the, these decodable texts more impactful. Choosing an academic word to teach and reinforce, making sure we ask deeper comprehension questions that get students rereading and developing um, some really important reading behaviors giving them some writing prompts that connect to the book and they have that book as a scaffold and so on. Okay, so we are we only have like a minute left and I didn't get through all that I wanted to. Uh, so I'm gonna to have to I'm gonna to have to stop here and I will send anyone who is interested in the PowerPoint for the things that we didn't that we didn't get through. I want to thank you for joining me today. We were going to talk a little bit about assessment. So there'll be some slides 
about that. Uh, during the conference, there is a pre-recorded session I did on assessment that you can that you can uh, take a look at and 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 listen to. I do want to say as sort of my final my final thought, the, something that I always leave the teachers that I present to. You know, I think giving the gift of reading is one of the greatest gifts we can give children because it's a gift once given can never be taken away and will forever transform a child's life. I think what we do is transformative. I think it's an incredible honor to be able to give that gift to children. I personally know what it's like to not have that gift with, with my, my family, which is why I shared that story at the beginning. I also think it's an enormous uh, responsibility to do it right and to do it well. And I wanna thank you for joining me today. I apologize I wasn't able to get through everything, but I wanna thank you for joining me and all that you do to do it right and to do it well. I hope you have a wonderful day. Thanks so much, Wiley, for taking the time to join us today. Um, thank you to Laura as well, um, and all of our friends at Sadlier. And um, please see a, um, a post-webinar survey that's in the chat. Um, you'll also see it right after the webinar. We appreciate your feedback. And uh, we also encourage you to, to fill that out if you're interested in a certificate of attendance for today's webinar. Um, and Wiley, we have, um, um, you know, if you have any other final thoughts for um, the last minute or two, um, we'd be happy to um, if you have to share any final thoughts there. No, I just, uh, I'd like to figure out a way that I can give everyone this PowerPoint because I wasn't able to sure. content. I'd love to have access to that. There are also a bunch of papers that I've written about the topics we're talking about that are available from Sadlier that I think, I think in the chat more has shared some links to some of those. So please take advantage of that as well to dig in deeper. I hope that this is just the, this sparks some conversation and some thought about how we can all um, fine tune our phonics instruction to maximize student learning. So if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out and ask me. Great, thanks so much, Wiley. Um, and yes, we'll definitely be able to, to share resources oh, um, afterwards in a follow-up. Wonderful. So thank everyone for joining us. Have a great rest of your day. God bless. Bye.